Okay, so to start out, let's suppose we have a normal subgroup N inside my group G of order 168. The way we're going to proceed is similar to the way we would proceed for the alternating group on five letters. First, we're going to partition the group up into a bunch of sets. We'll compute the order of each of those sets, and then we'll show that there's no way to add those sets up in a way that divides the order of the group. That way, will be no way to get a subgroup that's normal that also divides the order of the group. So let's review. I have my normal subgroup N inside of G. We're going to consider the conjugacy classes of X inside of G for a fixed element X. So if it helps, suppose X is inside of N. By definition, we're going to take all conjugates of X when we conjugate by G inside of the big group G. Since X is inside the normal group N, when I conjugate, I get another element inside of N, which means the whole entire conjugacy class winds up falling inside of N also. Do a little bit of review in a second, but the punchline is the CX partition N, and then we know that the order of n, the number of elements in n, will have to be equal to the sum of the orders of each conjugacy class as long as we count each conjugacy class exactly once. Okay, that's important formula number one. If you want a picture for all this, think of it this way. I have g. I chop g up into a bunch of pieces, which are going to be the conjugacy classes. And then when I take a look at n, we notice N is also carved out nice and neatly also by conjugacy classes of G. So there's no new lines when I put the lines in that partition off N. Okay, let's take a look at what's happening here. Conjugation and conjugacy classes correspond to group actions and orbits. So conjugation is just another group action of the group G on itself. Okay, so group action corresponds to conjugation. We have orbits of X. Remember, the orbit is just what happens if I fix a point X, let all elements of G act on it. That's going to correspond to our conjugacy class. The way we figure out what that is is, as a set, I take the group, and then I take the quotient out by the stabilizer of G on X, which is just going to be taking all these elements of G that act on X. The stabilizer are going to be the elements. When I let them act on X, they just send X back to itself. For conjugation, the stabilizer of X inside of G is just going to be the centralizer of X. So the centralizer of X is just going to be the set of all points in G, such that when I let them act on x by conjugation, we just get x back. If I move g to the other side on the right, we notice we get gx equal to x times g, and that's what it means to commute. It just doesn't matter what order you multiply x and g in. Now, using this little rule here, the conjugacy class corresponds to the orbit. The orbit can be thought of as a coset space, so when I count the number of elements in the conjugacy class, I'm just looking at the number of elements in G divided by the number of elements in the stabilizer. But the stabilizer is the centralizer. So I get my second important formula, which is the number of elements in the conjugacy class of X equals the number of elements in G divided by the number of elements in the centralizer of X. With our conjugacy class formulas worked out, now let's take a look at characteristic polynomials and minimal polynomials. So if I'm given a matrix A, its characteristic polynomial is defined by taking variable X times the identity matrix minus A, then take the determinant of that. Okay, so this is going to be an invariant we attach to a matrix A that's going to tell us a lot about special properties of A. So this brings in a lot of linear algebra. Okay, one thing we have is if the matrix A is conjugate to the matrix B, then they're going to have the same characteristic polynomial. 
So if I wanted to check whether two matrices were conjugate or not, I could check the characteristic polynomials. If they're different, then they can't be conjugate. Okay, if they're the same, they may or may not be conjugate. We'd have to do a little bit more digging. Okay, so the way I'll use this, which I leave as an exercise, is that on conjugacy classes of matrices, all the elements are going to have the same characteristic polynomial. Okay, my next result. Once I have the characteristic polynomial, we get this nice result called the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. If I have my characteristic polynomial and I write it out, if wherever I have an X, I put my matrix A, the solution of this is always going to be the zero matrix. It's a pretty neat result. You work out a few examples and get a feel for it. You can actually use it in a lot of applications. So now let's move on to the minimal polynomial. So, the minimal polynomial of the matrix A, what happens is we know that there is some polynomial such that if I put my matrix A in there, zero comes out. So that's going to mean that there's going to be a polynomial of smallest degree such that if I put my matrix in, zero comes out. It may not be the characteristic polynomial, might have a smaller degree than this. Okay, we can say a lot more, but we're not going to need much for this exercise, so I leave it there. Okay, one thing we do want to note, if A and B are conjugate, their minimal polynomials are going to be the same. And I leave that as an exercise. Again, if I take a look at the conjugacy class of A, every element inside of that conjugacy class will have the same minimal polynomial. So that way I can use the minimal polynomial to tell whether two conjugacy classes are not the same. Okay, if they have different minimal polynomials, then I know there's no overlap between those two sets. What are the characteristic polynomials that can occur for an A in SL3Z2? Since we're in SL3Z2, that means the determinant is equal to 1. So that's going to fix the constant term of my polynomial. Since we're looking at 3 by 3 matrices, the first term is always going to be x cubed. So the only degrees of freedom that we can have are going to be on the x squared and the x term. Since we're in Z2, that means we have two possibilities there, two possibilities there, and thus four possibilities for the characteristic polynomial of a given A. Let's run through each case. So for the first case, where I just set all of them equal to 1, over Z2, this factors into x plus 1 cubed which is the same as x minus 1 cubed. We write it this way so it highlights the fact that 1 is an eigenvalue. Since all the eigenvalues show up, that means Jordan form will apply, and then we've got three possibilities for the minimal polynomial. In my next case, we take a and b equal to 0, so I get x cubed plus 1. In this case, we could put the minus sign in there too, which will be good for our next board. I can factor, but I notice when I factor, it's not going to create anything too complicated, so it'll turn out the characteristic polynomial and the minimal polynomial are always going to be the same. For my last two cases, we'll have the same idea. These won't factor at all, so the minimal polynomial and the characteristic polynomial will be equal. For my case 3, we let a be equal to 1 b be equal to 0. I change the minus signs for the next board. And then for case 4, we'll have a equal to 0, b equal to 1, and then we change the minus signs for the next board. Now we can put numbers to things. So I'm going to summarize the whole big picture for the conjugacy classes here. Our strategy is to try to find matrices x that represent each conjugacy class. So using linear algebra, these are going to break into two sets. One set will be the Jordan forms, which are pretty easy to get a handle on. And then we also have companion matrices, which are kind of a way of, given a characteristic or minimal polynomial, how do you rig a matrix to have that as its polynomial? So let's see what's going on here. First, we list all the characteristic polynomials. You can just compute these pretty straightforward. 
three by three matrices, it's not a big computation. Then we go and get the minimal polynomials by just seeing what the smallest degree polynomial you can get your matrix into that gives you zero. So the most identity is x minus one, x minus one squared, x minus one cubed, x cubed minus one. And if we expand these here, we're gonna see that none of these minimal polynomials are gonna agree with each other. So each of these x that I'm using as representatives for the conjugacy classes will not be conjugate to each other, meaning each one represents its own conjugacy class. So all I would need to do then is show that if I add up all the orders of the conjugacy classes, I get 168, and then there can't be anything else. So let's look at the numbers here. Well, if you take a look, 1 plus 21 plus 42 plus 56 plus 24 plus 24, gives me 168. So if we believe in these numbers, then these will be all the constancy classes that we need. Now, to get these constancy class orders, I need to know how to get the centralizers. To get the centralizers, it's gonna be a straightforward. Remember, to be in the centralizer just means if I conjugate the element x by an element g, the element x comes out. So that looks like gx, g inverse equals x. You might be thinking that g inverse is gonna cause a lot of heartbreak, but no, you can just multiply both sides by g and get it to the other side. So we're really solving the equation gx equals xg. That's not so bad, not even with three by three matrices. So doing it this way, you'll notice that the first four with this equation are gonna be a straight shot. There's not a lot of heavy lifting to get your answer there. For the last two, they're not gonna be so easy but if you set up a flow chart correctly, you have no problem picking out the matrices that you need. At the end of the day, you just gotta make sure the determinant's equal to one. Okay, let me say a little bit more about companion matrices. The rule here is, if I rig up a three by three matrix such that I have a one in the second row, first column, a one in the second column, third row, so this is the subdiagonal. If I want to load coefficients into the characteristic polynomial, I just put them up with their negation from the polynomial. So that's just this column going up. So this would be the x squared minus term, the minus x coefficient, and then that's just minus the constant we use. So you can check this. And so this is really nice for cooking up matrices with a rig polynomial. For a final step, we're just left with the arithmetic. So recall, if n is normal in g, then the order of n is going to have to divide 168. We also have n is the sum of elements that are orders of conjugacy classes. So we just computed all of those, 1, 21, 24, 24, 42, and 56. Since the identity is in my normal subgroup, we have to use the 1 in our sum. So that's this. Now, so this is gonna be a divisor of 168. If you notice, the smallest thing, okay, if I use something else besides one, we're gonna to have to be bigger than 21 because we, at a minimum we'd have one plus the 21 or something bigger. Okay, but if I divide 168 by two, the biggest divisor that's gonna be for a non-trivial, it's gonna be 84. Go and look at 168. The divisors that wind up in this range are gonna be 24, 28, 42, 56, and 84. If you sit around and noodle a little bit, you're gonna notice there's no way we can write any of these as one plus a sum of elements from 21 to 56 here. So that means there's no way I can get a normal subgroup with the order that's gonna divide 168 so there's no way we can have a normal subgroup.